He used to go out in the yard and he'd be drinking. And I, that's the only way I hear him singing. I don't know if he made it up or what. And he'd walk around out in the yard and he'd be drunk and say, I had a pretty woman and an old gray mule to ride. That's what he said. My pretty woman left me and my old gray mule laid down and died. That was his song. That's all I remember my daddy saying. <laughs> that's awful, isn't it? And, then, and, and, and sometimes get, my sister would play some boogie woogie something on a piano and he'd, some great balls of fire or something and they'd, they'd been in there and sing but, and then he'd try to sing at church but I never got to do that with him praise the Lord for that alright let's take our Bible turn to Genesis chapter 18 this morning and I want to look at some scripture here today Genesis chapter number 18 and I'm going to read you about one of the great fathers in the Bible and uh, that would be the man Abraham. And this is a message to our daddies today. And I want to preach this morning on the best dad in town. The best dad in town. I hope that's your desire and goal. And I know we got a lot of good, wonderful daddies here at Shining Light Baptist Church. Many of you men, thank you for being the role model and the and the example and the daddy that you, you should be for your family. God will bless you for that. But here in Genesis chapter 18, the Lord made a statement about Abraham. And uh, he said there in verse 17, when he's calling him, he said, The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him. Is that what God said about Abraham? I know him. I know that guy. He will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. I want to talk this morning to the best dad in town, Father's Day. Um, I got it. A little gripe that I need to get off my chest first. Got me before I get in a good mood, preach this sermon. And uh, I I feel I feel like people are a little biased toward us daddies. Mother's Day gets did you know, did you know that Mother's Day was celebrated 58 years before Father's Day was. That hurts my feelings. <laughs> what about us? Did you know that there are over 20 million more Mother's Day cards, Happy Mother's Day, sent than there are Father's Day cards? Did you know that years ago, back when everybody had regular phones, when you call somebody, you'd call them, uh, and if you didn't want to pay for it, you'd call them collect. This is collect call from so-and-so and so-and-so. Do you accept charge? You know, and you could either hang up or accept. Guess what the main day of the year was for collect calls? <laughs> I'm calling you to wish you fathers, happy Father's Day, and you're paying for it. I'm a little, I'm a little ticked off about that. You're biased against us daddies. That's sexist to say that Mother's Day is more important than Father's Day. What about us? You mothers get all the attention. We, we, you, you, you're just stepping on our rights. Now listen to me. When you, we're coming over for steaks uh, Sunday, Dad. Daddy's going to buy the grill and pay for it. Daddy's going to find up paying for the steaks. He's going to cook them. He's going to clean up the mess. And then here's a card that says, I love you. I'll see you next, year, next time. I'm just kidding. All of these past five minutes was kidding. But the truth is, the, the reason people think like that is because daddy is, uh, you, when you think of dad, you're thinking he's going to take care of it. And that's, the reason, that's the reason that attitude is there. And I'm the same way. Uh, we all are. Uh, I have many titles this morning that I go by. Some people call me, Brother Danny, that's most people that I know call me Brother Danny. Some people call me pastor. Some people call me preacher. Some people call me 
reverend. One lady in here who's the only one has a right to calls me babe. <laughs> but that name, Daddy, is a special name. Now, I want to talk about being the best daddy in town, and the first thing I want to say is the best daddy in town devotes his family to the Lord. It's his responsibility. It's a dad's responsibility to devote his family to the Lord more than even the woman because he is the head of the household. The Bible said there in Ephesians 5, 23, uh, he, being the head of the house, he is the Savior of of the body. So that means it is the daddy's mainly responsibility to see that his family goes to church, serves God, honors the Lord, kids are in church, and all that. Thank God, thank God for daddies who will say, I will command my household after me, and my family are going to go to church. He loves and cares for his wife and gives his family to God. He don't use his position and family and kids to make himself look good or important. He's happy if they'll do right. Now, now what do I mean by that? I've been around people, and I have been around some big shots, and I'm not comfortable around big shots because I'm not one, but I've been around them some. And I've seen people who like to sit around uh, at, at the lake house, and, and they have a lot of money, and their friends have a lot of money, and their friends have a lot of money, and their friends have a lot of money, and their only basis of fellowship is money. That's a, that's a common ground. And one will say, uh, now what's your son doing? Oh, he's, he's uh, just enrolled in Harvard. And, 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 you know, like, we are great because our son is this and that. And, and then they'll say, oh, yeah, well, my daughter, she just got her degree from all that. And you know what these people are doing? They're, they're using their kids to make their self look great and special. That's really not nothing to brag about. You know what? Uh, uh, and there's nothing wrong with education. There's nothing wrong with the right kind of education at all. Don't get me wrong. But I'm going to tell you something. I've always believed this, and I was taught this. If my, my kids will, if my girls are there this morning, if they'll do right, as long as they're saved and honest and are not lazy, I'm happy. If they're saved and honest and not lazy and will work, I thank God. Listen, I consider my kids, uh, I'm not going to be around my friends and be embarrassed if I can't say my kid has a degree from here, my kid has a degree from there. Nothing wrong with that. But that, that's, not my, that's not my level of success. I don't, that's not my goal in life. My goal in life is them to be honest and be saved and love the Lord and not be lazy. And if you can say that, then, then you are devoting your family to the Lord. They don't have to be rich and famous and live in luxury lifestyle. If they're living right and serving God and honest and will work, that's something to be thankful for. It's not, you don't live just to see what you can accumulate. Uh, being healthy and living right is way more important than just accumulating stuff. You mean that we devote our family to the Lord? That means this. I told my, my girls, I told my family, uh, my, my dad's like this from West Virginia. My mom was like this and her family up in Spruce Pine. Whatever we go through, we go through it together. We're family. Family sticks together. I'm sticking with you. You sticking with me. We're sticking together no matter what. We may disagree. We may disappoint each other. We may, but brother, it, you, you're going to have to come through all of us. You come through any of us. That's the way it's supposed to be. A dad devotes his family to the Lord. You know what we've, I've always taught my kids, and you should too, nothing or nobody is going to come between us. Nothing or nobody is going to separate us. Nothing or nobody, is, uh, 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 um, uh, I want them to know my daddy will be there. I don't, I don't ever want them to think, I'm, I'm going I'm to call daddy and ask him about something, but he's liable to be drunk or high. No, no. I want them to know my daddy's going to be there. My daddy's like, a, like that rock, like a harder, than that, harder than that cherry wood right there. My dad will be there. Daddy will be there. Daddy will be there. I want to say, daddy, devote your family to the Lord. Your first 
and foremost goal is my family is saved and loves the Lord and lives for the Lord. Everything else, house, land, car, all that stuff is good, but that's secondary to living for the Lord and doing right. Amen? Number two, number two, a real dad disciplines those he loves. A real father. And you know why? You know how you know that? Because that's the way the heavenly father is. The Bible said in Hebrews 12, verse 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, the Bible said that our heavenly father chastens every son whom he receiveth. Did you know God disciplines every child he has? There's, that, that, that tells us something. There's never been a Christian that God didn't have to discipline. The only person in the world who has never needed discipline was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And uh, he learned it as a man, but he, he was God, so he, I mean, he wasn't going to sin no way. Uh, they, they brought up the question, here's your theological thought. For some of you people has got brains, uh, they ask, the old question is, could Jesus have sinned? And the answer is, he couldn't cause he wouldn't, and he wouldn't cause he couldn't. And you'll think about that for about two hours. Uh, he couldn't cause he wouldn't, and he wouldn't cause he couldn't. I'm glad, but everybody else, everybody else, me, you, my girls, your little br darling, uh, the, uh, all of them needed at one time discipline. That's right. The Bible said in he, uh, uh, Proverbs 13, 24, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. I heard a preacher quote this on the radio. I, I've been trying to listen to some Father's Day sermon this week, and I searched in vain for some, some real good, hard Father's Day preaching. and finally got a few. Uh, but I listened to a couple of these guys, and I was so disappointed. I heard this one preacher, and he was pr quoting that verse there, and he said foolishness, but his, his Bible didn't say foolish. It, had, it milked it down a little bit to like uh, rebellion or something. It said rebellion can be in the heart of a child, and he stopped and didn't quote the rest of the verse. Split it right down the middle because that verse of Scripture fits our day and time and lifestyle. The other half don't. But if that one half is inspired, the other half is inspired. And the Bible said foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Now, y'all know how I believe about that. I don't believe anybody that would be mean to a kid ought to go to jail. Anybody that would hurt a child or abuse a child should be in jail. Make sure if you quote me, quote that part too. Ain't, nobody should ever be mean to a child. But on the same hand, God, yet God fixed it in the Bible that you are to take a rod. That's a hickory switch. It's about as big as this right here. And, and it's, it's limber. It's not, it's not stiff like this. And like that right there. And go like that when, when they're little. Now, you reach a certain age, of course, uh, you just say, well, now, if you're, if you're dumb enough now, you're just going to have to find out the hard way. But when they're little, a hickory switch is used to discipline and correct, and you cannot improve on that form of discipline. I, I heard that, that preacher, I couldn't believe my ears. The preacher said, now, I'm not suggesting that you spank or what. And I thought, what, what Bible are you reading, man? Uh, listen, it don't matter what our generation says. It don't matter what Dr. Spock, who should be spanked, said. It don't matter what so-and-so thought. It, it really doesn't matter. I'm telling you, God said in the Bible, the rod of correction. And you know why it said rod? Because that way you fear the rod. You don't fear the hand. Uh, we was behind somebody going to church one Sunday, and uh, one Sunday, and she's reaching back her own smack, <laughs> right over a little bit, smack, reaching back there, and obviously it did her kids no good at all. That kind of discipline does no good at all. They're not supposed to fear your hand. They're supposed to fear the rod. Amen. Mom would take one about that big right there, and she'd put it up on top of the refrigerator. Now, you know why? Why did she put it on top of the refrigerator? We couldn't reach it. You put it down here where they can find it, them little devils, will hide, go, they'll hide it somewhere, up under the bed somewhere, and you won't, and then when it's time, time for a, a whipping, you can't, well, I'll just give up. Now, I'm not saying you should spank them every time, at least little things. Some people overdo it, but there are times, there are times when a hickory switch will get the job done that nothing else will do, and I don't care what you read. I don't care who you've been listening to. I don't, you will not improve on what God said in the Bible. Amen. People that are mean to kids ought to go to jail. People that just spank them for every time they look at them cross-eyed ought, ought to be ashamed of themselves. And people who just spank their kids when they're mad and aggravated ought to be ashamed of themselves. But there's a right kind of discipline. 
Somebody mentioned it up here a minute ago. Have you ever noticed that girls who have a daddy in the home, especially a good daddy, make better choices for a lot of times for, for boyfriends or husbands than girls who don't? On average, not all, not all, on average. And the reason is because when she comes home and says, look, look here, this is, this is ugly. Would you like to meet him? That's ought to be his name. And, and, and you know what mom will do? Mom will fall for it. Mom will say, oh, he's cute. I think he's sweet. Ask daddy what he thinks. <laughs> we don't give them a chance. They're condemned before they open their mouth. We know they're up to no good. Now, if you've never had a daughter, you don't know how, how, how it feels. You get a daughter, brother. You get a daughter. There's that... You know why? You know why we don't like them? Because we know they're just like us when we was that age. I know what you're up to, buddy. Don't give me this junk. You're gonna be nice to her and buy. Shut up, please. I don't even want to hear it. That's the way daddy is. Listen, my daddy, he he like I said, daddy wasn't even saved. And my, my sister in Old Fort's probably watching this right now. And I might not have this story exactly right, but I get the main part right. That uh when, when they were growing up, my sister, my two sisters, uh, they both had boyfriends, and their boyfriends would come over to the house every day, every day, and I'd beg them to come and play ball. Down, uh, we had a basketball goal down below the hill, and I'd say, come on down here, Lord, let's play 21, let's play 21. And I'd get them down there, and we'd be playing ball, and we'd, we'd cut up for a while and everything. I kept them down there as long as they would stay play, uh, shooting basketball. But then they finally got to where mom would let, mom would let them go somewhere, let them date. And uh, they, they said they had to be home at 11 o'clock. We had this dog named Nick, and he was a, a, a collie about that big. And I'm telling you, Nick did not like them boys, especially one of them. That's, I, that boy could pull up in the yard, had a motorcycle, and, and he'd just go crazy. That dog go crazy. And he had, had fangs and claws, and he bit him. He scared to death that dog. And that, and that dog, every boyfriend my sisters brought there to the house, Nick hated them. And uh, it, it, they got to where they'd say, where's the dog at? Where's the dog at? And my sisters had to get the dog in the house to, before they, the boyfriend could even come in. And I remember them coming in there. And one night, they said, Daddy told them, they said, you're going to be home by 11 o'clock, which is, that's, that's too late. And they shouldn't have been out with them no way, but that's, that's what they did. And they, they, they said, you're going to be home by 11 o'clock. Well, that night, I think it was about 10 after 11, that car come up the driveway real quiet, turned the motor off, turned in there because they know it was late, and they started opening the doors real quiet. They thought Mom and Dad was in the bed, and it was all dark in there. They said, just sneak out right here, and they were getting out of the car, and they were saying, where's Nick? Where's Nick? And about that time, Daddy jumped out behind the bus with a shotgun, and he said, I'm the one you better be worried about, not Nick. That's true. And, but he put the fear of God in them boys. Now, if you all go to God's boys, and they, they, then you have a much easier job. Don't, I'm telling you. Uh, I mean, boys are easy when they're growner, and girls are harder when they're growner, if, that's, if, that, if you understand that. Now, it's tough, tough. But, but the, the girl, you worry about them more. And, uh, and these and the, he disciplines those that he loves, those that he loves. No matter how tired you get, listen to me, all you daddies, no matter how tired you get out of it, keep a watch on that phone. No, I don't, you, say, you know what people do? They buy them a phone and say, all right, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're not taking, you're not, I'm going to watch whatever they do. And they do it for about two months and lack off, slack off, Slack off. And I can tell you two or three examples just lately of parents who say the worst mistake I ever made in my life was letting that kid have a phone. And all of them thought they could trust that kid. And I'm going to tell you what you better do. You better fix it to where you can check it. You better fix it to where they can't hide it from you. Uh, uh, Ethan's got a phone now. He, before he goes to bed at night, he lays it on the counter. It don't go to his room at night. He lays it on the counter, and he can get it up the next morning. Now, that's, that's being easy. You ought to at least do that. At least. At most, throw it in the lake. But at least do that. Amen. Uh, it's your job to discipline those that you love. Number three, right quick, 
a real dad, the best dad in town, delights in his children. He delights in his children. You can father a child without being a real daddy. A lot of them do that. It's aggravating. It's aggravating sometimes to buy a real nice pair of tennis shoes and then you come home one day and there's one of them soaking wet at the door with mud on them and the other one's out there and the dog, dog got it out in the yard. That's aggravating. It's aggravating uh, when, you, when you spend a fortune and buy, for the first piano lessons and they quit after the second or third week and you done went and bought a keyboard and everything. That's aggravating. It's aggravating to spend money on stuff and, and, and nice clothes and stuff and see them take it for granted. But listen, brother, you better delight in your kid. You, sometimes you better listen to them. Sometimes you need to listen to your kids. You know that? There was one time I was eating a, a meal and, a, and this little kid said, Daddy, is it okay to eat bugs? He said, Son, don't talk about stuff like that at the table. What's wrong with you? Well, he got through eating everything. He said, Now, what was you wanting to ask me? He said, Never mind now. It was in your soup and it's gone. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you better. <laughs> like dad told the kid one time, he said, Put the cat out. He said, I know it was on fire. Sometimes they'll get you like that. When that one kid told his daddy, he said, uh, Daddy, I can go to a concert this weekend for 45 cents. He said, no, you can't do it. He said, I can. 45 cents, I can go, can I go? He said, well, who is giving a concert for 45 cents? He said, it's 50 cent featuring Nickelback. <laughs> smart kid, huh? One kid, uh, uh, one phone rung to school one day, and the school nurse answered the phone and said, yes, who is this? A voice on the other end said, my kid can't come today. He's sick. She said, oh, yeah, and who is this? He said, this is his father. <laughs> Mikey made a mistake there, didn't he? Now, do not, do not, do not, do not ever get to the point where your kids hate you or dread to see you coming and be mean to them. Let them say, listen, if I got a problem, I know I can talk to my daddy. If I got a burden, I know daddy will help me bear it. If I get sick, I can call my daddy and he can pray. If I got problems, daddy's there. He'll be a rock to my family, to my life. Amen. 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 I heard a preacher this week. I was listening to preachers and I was, I was so hurt and disappointed. I heard one guy quote half that verse scripture. Foolishness bound in the heart of a child. Stop. Cut it in two. Leave the verse out that's trendy. Leave the bad part out that's old fashioned. I heard another preacher say, and he, the tone of voice is just about all more than I can stand. He said, all right, all you dads out there now, we're going to have a great time today. I don't know what your idea of having a, a good time is. Maybe it's taking your family out to this. Maybe it's a glass of wine at the, at the lake this weekend. I, think not. I feel sorry for you if you got a preacher that thinks a good time is having a glass of wine at the lake. You got, you got, you got problems. You crazy for going to a church like that? Lord, have mercy, people. Listen, and I know how people think. I know people say, "Well, people used to think that, but now we found out that in the Bible, yeah, you're, you're a Bible, you're a foot too." Listen, God don't want you to drink wine. Me to drink wine. Nobody drink wine. And a preacher that says it's a good idea of a good time drinking wine is a nut. That makes me old-fashioned and mean-spirited. In their eyes. If you are right with this generation, you are wrong with God and the Bible. Something wrong. This generation ain't right, people. The world going the wrong way. Be in the world, not of the world. And if a world likes your preacher, you got the wrong preacher. You got the wrong preacher. And I'm not I'm not I'm I'm willing I'm not willing to make enemies because of my disposition. We're not supposed to do that, but I'm willing to make enemies because of my position. If I have to. I'm not looking to make enemies. Number four, and I'll be through. A real father demonstrates following Jesus. Like Elisha followed Elijah. It wasn't his daddy, but the, the principle is there. Like Solomon followed David. Kids need to see a sermon just as important as hearing a sermon. You ever thought about the things that you learned? I thought this week all the stuff that I learned accidentally just watching daddy. You know what I learned? Stuff like smoothing concrete. 
Daddy poured sidewalks around the house. And I must have been, I don't know, 11, 12 years old. And I remember him, he'd take a trowel and he'd go like this. And it flowed. And I remember, I can see that in my mind's eye. And I thought, do you know, you think every boy knows, you'd be surprised the young boys have no idea how to mix up a bag of concrete and, boy, and just smooth it up. They have no clue. They think you just buy a chunk of concrete big as your driveway and have it installed, I reckon. Have a big truck bring it or something like that. And just post hole diggers. Daddy had post hole diggers. He had a degree, a PhD. And he had post hole diggers. And I remember him saying, now, here's how you dig a fence. He was putting up a fence. And he'd go, boom, go in the ground. And then you pull them apart like that and pick up that little bit of dirt, drop it over here. And then you push it down that same hole, pick up that little bit of dirt, and put it down here. And, then, and I remember watching them go down and down. Well, I learned how to do that from him. You say, what good is that? Ain't much nowadays. But these kids nowadays, they don't know what post hole digger. Go, go to Lowe's and buy me some post hole digger. What's that? I remember daddy had a big old saw when I was little. Big old, one of them big long ones about here at the piano where we got a chainsaw. And he'd have a log up here like this. And he'd say, now you get on this, this side and I'm gonna, and you can't push him because they'll, they'll bow up like that. He said, you just pull it. And I'd pull it. Then he'd pull it back the other way. And I'd pull it back this way. And he said, just let the saw do the work. Let it just ride in there. And those all, don't, don't kill you. Just little stuff like that. Little old stuff like that. Just, and, and I'm not talking about, I, I, listen, how much better would it be for your kids to grow up saying, I remember seeing my daddy on his knees praying. If I can remember my dad with a, with a cross-cut saw, and I remember him taking post hole diggers and saying, Daddy used to tamp, you know, when you put a fence post, and you tamp it. How many of you young boys know what tamping is? Okay, not a young boy in here raise their hand. Tamp is when you take another post or a steel post and hit it down in there and knock that dirt around and make it solid because it's going to sink if you just put it in there loose. Just stuff like that. If I can remember, if I can remember my dad doing that and it's vivid and to this day, if I'm going to dig a hole or something, I know how to do it. I know how to plant grass. I know how to uh, uh, tie up a yard. I know how to cut grass. I know how to uh, saw a log and two. To this day, if I learned that from my dad, how much more if they see their daddy on his knees praying? How much more if they see their daddy open the Bible? How much more if they see their daddy every Sunday morning get up and say, we're going to church this morning and grab the family and put them in the car, demonstrate following the Lord Jesus Christ. It will pay off one of these days. Don't whine and complain. Don't fuss all the time about your job and how bad you off, how bad off you are and how everybody's treating you wrong. And all. Don't talk like that in front of your kids. Say, God's been good to us. God's been blessed to us. We got more than we deserve. The Lord's blessed us. Don't raise a griper and complainer. Uh, hey, listen, if you're going to gripe, gripe to the Lord and tell him, Lord, I feel like I'm, I'm being done wrong. Lord, help me get that better job. Help me to get a raise. Let your boys see you. I don't ever remember my daddy complaining, ever. Buddy, he had some stuff to complain about. Now, Mom, she done enough for both of them. But Daddy didn't. He'd get up in the morning, drink about five cups of coffee, and smoke a cigarette like staring out the window. And then he's gone, buddy. Bam, 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 all day long. He was thinking, I got to do this, 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 got to do this. He would say, well, they're going to come cut our power off and I've tried three places this year and they wouldn't hire me. Once every two months, he demonstrated. When the storm comes, when the devastating news comes, kids need to be able to say this, I know the God that brought my daddy through will bring me through. I watched daddy trust God when things were hard. and That faith has been passed right on down to me. Like we teach them this. You, you might teach your, your boys. All right, son, if you're ever out on the highway and you break down, call AAA or whatever. Or call, call, call a record service. I'll give you a number. Son, if you ever get in trouble, if something terrible happens, call 
911. And we teach our kids, if you're ever out there and your car breaks down, call this number, call that, call that. And you know what we ought to teach them? Son, when you need help, you know how to call the Lord and call on God. Ten children one time in a family. And it was all together. And the dad pastored a little small Methodist church. Didn't have it, just a few people. Hardly made any money. And his kids were grown, college age. And one of them said to his dad, if you hadn't wasted all these years preaching, don't you, you got a lot of brains. You could have made a lot of money and sent us all to college. And the daddy just turned and looked out the window and tears started coming down his face and finally he turned around with tears in his eyes and said you're right I could have made a bunch of money and I could have sent you all to college but I cared more about your soul and if you woke up in hell you'd hate me for not taking you to church and serving God and doing right and he said I, I want you to know when I leave this world that I live for the Lord and I love Jesus and I've done what's right what's really important to you That's a successful dad. I'll read you this and I'm through this morning. Come on, sister. There are little eyes upon you. They are watching day and night. There are little ears that listen to every word you say. There are little hands all eager to do the things you do. And a little boy is dreaming of the day he'll be like you. You are the little fellow's hero. You're the wisest of the wise. In his little mind, about you no suspicions ever rise. There's a wide-eyed little fella who believes you're always right. And his ears are always open. He watches you day and night. You're setting an example every day in all you do for the little boy who is waiting to grow up to be like you. Let's stand together. Every head bowed and every eye closed. We'll take just a minute here. Say, Dad, if you'd like to meet here to altar, we'll come and pray. If you want to pray there at your seat, that's fine too. Some are coming. I, I want us to rededicate our lives as daddies and determine in our heart that the Lord would look at us and say, like he did Abraham, I know him. He'll command his children after me. I know that guy. He'll teach them the right way. He'll teach them the right way. How about it, Daddy? Maybe there's a dad here this morning that you say, Preacher, I ain't been the kind of daddy that I need to be. And I'm coming to that altar this morning, and I'm going to give my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm going to honor God. From this day forward, it's going to be different. You need to come. Come on right now. Come on, let's pray. Come on, let's pray. Maybe you've never even been saved. Maybe you've never been saved. This will be the best day ever to be saved on Father's Day. Hallelujah. Maybe you're here this morning. God's dealing with your heart about as a daddy. He said, I've, I've, I've done wrong, preacher. I need, to, I need to be a better example for my kids. You need to come and pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, this morning for all you've done for us. I pray now that you bless every single person here this morning. God, do what ought to be done in every heart and every life. We love you. Lord, I pray that you bless all the daddies out there that are having a hard time. Some of them are struggling. Some of them are brokenhearted. Some of them are having to do a, be a single parent. Some of them are having financial troubles. Some even physical troubles. God, I pray that you bless every single one of them. Now, Lord, do what ought to be done in our hearts this morning. As we go our separate ways, Bless every family here today. We we'll thank you and praise you for it. We love you. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen.